This YouTube is a recording of the PC care and maintenance course I developed for Computer Pals for Seniors at Castle Hill. Being a YouTube, it's quite handy to be able to pause it or replay sections a second time if you didn't get the drift the first time. So that said, let's get underway. This is the PC care and maintenance course. And uh, we'll start with just doing some overview slides before we get into the content of the course. So just a bit of course housekeeping. Uh, this course is based on Windows 10 and I will continue to make comments obviously associated with Windows 11 if there's significant differences, but the majority of machines around today are still Windows 10. It's a mainly theory course and there's no practical uh, exercises unless you want to try things and look at things when you get home. There's no formal course manual, but you will have access to this, uh, this set of slides or the print from the set of slides. And there's ample space at the bottom to make some notes as you go through the course. Uh, the current version of these notes is available online. So if I uh, correct or enhance the slides, they will always be available at this URL shown on this slide. Now just a word about uh, free software. I mentioned some free software programs in this uh, course and uh, you've always got to be careful when you're using free software or download and install free software because it could uh, contain malware. But as far as I know, uh, all of this uh, software I may mention in the course has been used in manuals and to the best of my knowledge um, there it, it contains no nasties, but always bear in mind that there always is a small risk. Uh, most well-known developers would never tarnish their name by, uh, by sending out software, but in the distribution of it, things can happen which is out of their control, so it's just worth bearing that in mind. Okay, so what are the objectives of this course? Um, the objectives are twofold, really. Um, it's really to increase your overall knowledge of the PC hardware and software, and hence your overall confidence using a PC. A lot of people uh, feel fairly fragile using a PC. They're worried about doing something wrong. And it's unlikely they will do, um, but by knowing a bit more about it, you are more likely to feel a bit more confidence in moving forward and just trying things. The second thing is to help you set up some regular maintenance tasks. So once you know a bit more about the PC, you will know that there's certain things that can be done on a regular basis to improve its performance and its security. Um, going forward. So it just helps you know what to do each month um, to your, for your PC's best uh, interest. Okay, so knowing your PC better, we're going to cover the following things. Um, we're going to talk about some of the controls I set when I'm setting up a brand new PC. We're going to look at the control panel itself and the settings area of Windows 10. Two of them are two quite separate areas. And we're going to have a run through the hardware that the PC has uh, installed and the software that's also installed. And we're going to look at Microsoft updates, which is an important, very important part of both maintenance and when you get a new machine because it will not be up to date. Um, we'll look at things like the Windows firewall and internet options. We'll look at folders and file types, both of which are very important and fundamental to using a PC. And we'll do a hardware and software audit, something that will allow you to get a listing of what's on the PC and the software that's in the PC. And we'll look at startup programs and the significance of startup programs. 
And finally, we'll look at um, Task Manager and Process Explorer, two very uh, useful tools that will allow you to monitor the performance of the machine. And the Windows Registry. Now, we'll only do a very brief look at the Windows Registry really for you to understand what it's about rather than with any intention that you go into it and make changes. It is a key component to Windows, all Windows operating systems. And uh, it's important to understand it exists and um, what it does, but not necessarily go there unless you really got a lot of confidence. Next, we're going to have a look at backups and what they are and how you go about backing up your data and software. Um, and we'll look at what needs to be backed up as a minimum and as a maximum. And we'll look at backup media choices, like what are you going to do the backups onto, flash drives, DVDs, external hard drives, that sort of thing. How you store those backups, where you store them and how you store them, it is important. And the backup frequency of how often you should be backing up. We'll look at the special folders of documents, photos and music, which are your personal folders and the importance of those. And look at photo organisation to make your backing up easier and more efficient. And we'll look at the need or not of backing up emails and contact lists. Um, to some people, this will not be an issue. To others, it will be. So we'll look at those implications. And we'll look at backing up your usernames and passwords, a really important thing these days um, with all the security issues around. And finally, we'll look at disk images. Um, the uh, benefit of doing a full disk image versus just backing up individual pieces of data. After that, we're going to look at some defensive software. Um, defensive software being like things like anti-malware software. So we're going to look at precautions to prevent you getting viruses um, and the virus scanner software that's available, the types and how it works and, and so on. We'll look at the important issue of phishing, um, which is probably the most prevalent thing that's happening these days and where most of the scams start. Uh, we'll look at firewalls, the importance and relevance of firewalls. We'll look at Wi-Fi security. Um, everybody has Wi-Fi these days in their homes and not necessarily everyone has it as secure as it should be. And finally, we'll just look at some definite defensive do's and don'ts. In other words, what you shouldn't do and what you should do. After that, we're going to look at monthly maintenance, the sort of tasks that you should be doing on a monthly basis. Things like backups, Microsoft updates, uh, other updates, other software updates, virus scans to make sure your machine is clean, and uh, hard disk maintenance, what you need to do to keep your hard disk or your storage drive in, in best condition. And finally, we'll look at literally PC cleaning, what you should do um, for a laptop or a desktop machine in terms of its actual cleanness or dust-free dust um, care and so on. So we'll look at that practical issue. Okay, so let's have a look at getting to know your PC better. And the first question you'd say, well, why bother at all? And it is, does depend a lot on what you use your machine for. If you're just using it to play a few games and to look up recipes and do a bit of email, it's not as critical as if you're tracking your finances and super and doing your tax on it or maybe running a small business and so on. So it does depend on how critical it is. But a lot of people have many, many photos stored on their machines, which um, they would be most upset if they lost those. So if you do store a lot of photos, you really do need to take some care of your machine. And when we get to backups, we'll see why. So 
The other reason to get to know your PC better is that you sort of know what to expect. It's a bit like driving a car. When you're driving a car, you feel um, you know when the car is behaving normally, when it goes over bumps or, or whatever. But when it's not behaving normally, you're also fairly conscious of it. And the same thing with a PC. When it's working normally, everything, you don't think about it much. But when something is happening, it's making a noise or it's uh, very slow or uh, some program isn't working, then you know to look further. And if you know what's going on under the bonnet a bit more, you can have some idea of maybe what is not working um, as it should and, and even to know where to look for the problem. So those are the two key things of knowing your PC better. Now when you get a new PC, uh, when you get a, a what I call a retail PC which is a manufactured um, PC, either a laptop or a desktop from someone like HP, or Asus, or Dell, or Lenovo, when you get it home, you have got to unpack the components. And when you first switch it on, you've got to make a lot of decisions about keyboards and regions and usernames and whether you want to, uh, to sign into your Microsoft account and those sort of things. So. It's as well to be um, ready for those questions because um, a lot of people only set up a new machine very rarely. I probably set up a new machine once a month or more. And these configuration questions can be a challenge to some people. And if you don't make the right decisions, it can be a little bit hard to fix them up sometimes. So, um, if you're not confident in doing it, do get someone else to help you. And this is all before you get to the desktop, you know, the familiar desktop with icons on it that you recognize. All of this setup is in, a, in, in screens you will probably have never seen before. So after you've got to the desktop, you need to do basic stuff like looking whether there's any pre-installed software you don't necessarily want on the machine because commercial PCs often come bundled with stuff. And you've got to set up your desktop icons that you want and set up power settings and set up um, screen savers if that's what you want to do. And they've got to then install, uh, to update Windows because if the machine has been in a box for the last six months or more, it won't have the latest Windows operating system updates and may not even have some feature updates, than the ones that come out every six months. So there's a lot of updating to be done. After, obviously, you've already got it connected to the internet. And then after you've got all this done, you've then got to start installing the software that you want. You know, it might be MS Office, it might be virus scanners. Um, so it, it's not a simple task and it is scary for some people. So um, best not to start if you're uh, not sure you can complete because it can sometimes be a problem getting it back to where it should be. So the main part of all the settings on a Windows machine are in two places on a Windows 10 and a Windows 11 machine. Um, there's in the settings panel, which is the new version of control panel. Uh, and some of you will remember in Windows 7 and prior to that, there was uh, always the control panel, which is where all your settings were. The control panel still exists in Windows 10 and 11, but Microsoft is slowly moving everything from control panel to the settings panel. And the settings panel is uh, accessed from the start menu, that's the, the um, button in the bottom left hand corner on Windows 10. Uh, it's uh, in a different place on Windows 11 because they've moved all the icons to the center. But it's the, still the start button and you would go to the start button and click on settings. 
And, and here you've got all the system stuff, time, language, updates, security, all sorts of things in the settings panel. If you want to go to the control panel, which, uh, like I say, is still there, then the best thing to do is to click on start and then just start typing control panel and you'll find that control panel as an app comes up and you can just click on it and just select it and click on it um, so there is these two places and it's not easy to say where some settings are um, they, because they're moving them slowly from control panel to settings each version of the operating system, whether it's Windows 10 or Windows 11, that a particular setting may be in either or both of these areas. Um, in control panel, and we're going to have a look at this, I'm going to demonstrate it in a minute, but in the control panel, when you go into there, you, you set it up so that you can easily access the various parts, and uh, I recommend that you use uh, the category view um, or, or icons, uh, which is the recommended way of doing it. Um, so we're going to have a look at this um, uh, to see where these two settings are before we go on to some of the other um, personalization and simple settings part. So I'm going to now just flip to the desktop um, uh, so we can do that. So here we are on a Windows 10 desktop and if we were wanting to go into the settings panel, not control panel, settings panel, you go down to the start menu and then click on settings where, where the uh, cursor is. And if we click on settings, we get to a screen that looks something like this. Just move this out of the way. And you can see things about system and devices, uh, phone, language, accounts, apps, and so on, and Windows updates. So that's the settings panel. This is where Windows is moving everything to. But where it was, the, I'll just go through to control panel so you can see the difference. So we'll close that one. And if we go down to the start menu again, and I type control panel, if I just type control, you'll see control panel app comes up up here and over here. If you click on that, it'll take you to the control panel. Now, if you've not uh, been here before on, on a new machine, it will look more like um, this which um, is the standard default way of demonstrating. It's very hard to work out what you want from in here. But if you go to category and select small icons, it comes to this. And this is a bit more definitive on what you want to look for. For example, if you're looking for regional settings or programs and features, um, or you're looking for the sound, the audio, or the mouse, it's a bit easier to find what you're looking for. So this is in control panel. The previous screen I had was the new settings panel. And as I say, the, the, some of the stuff is in both, but some of it is in one or the other, which can become very confusing. For people that have been using computers for a long time, um, we often find that control panel is the easiest way to find something um, if, in fact, it's still in control panel, but it's quicker to get to it from there. If you're in the Windows Starts panel, which I'll go back to here, probably the easiest way to find it in here is to actually just search on what you're looking for. So if you want a region, you can just search on region and you get to region settings. So a lot of people say, oh no, on the settings panel, just easier to search up here than try and work out which of these 
categories the setting is actually located in. So that's settings panel. So if we go back to the presentation, um, we're working down through this, and, and I've got down here right click on the desktop to set and left click personalization. This is to get to things that are things like the lock screen for screensaver and power settings. This is probably the easiest way to get to it. I mean, you can get to it from the control panel or the settings panel, but it's easier just to click on person, right click and left click on personalization. And we're going to do that next. So in there, you can set screensaver and power settings. You can set backgrounds and colors and desktop icons, all of which is what we're going to do right now. So I'm going to go back to um, the desktop again. And if we cl right click anywhere on the desktop, you'll notice you come up with a personalized option down here. And if you go into this personalize option, you'll notice down the left hand side, you've got some things like colors and themes and so on. And down the right hand side, you've got some information and related uh, sections. Now it sort of takes experience, but I know that if you go to themes, um, you will also find uh, the themes is where you might set your background and colors and so on. But you also find desktop icon settings. Now these are never set for some unknown reason on a Windows machine. They're never set. Uh, these tick marks here are never there. The, or I should say these two are never there. Recycle bin is the only one that is ticked. And the recycle bin on the desktop is the only icon there'll probably be on the desktop. For some unknown reason, Microsoft never ticks these two by default, which um, I find are essential desktop icons, both the computer one to, to look around the computer and to look around the user files. So the first thing I do is turn these two on and apply. They're already there on this machine, so, so that's why I don't have to apply. It's grayed out. The next thing that I do in here is go through to um, the lock screen. And the lock screen has settings on it for um, uh, screensaver settings. And I always set a machine up on screensaver to have a screensaver that comes in after 10 minutes. Now, I have it switched off on this machine because I'm using it to do these um, course presentations. And what I don't want it to do is go to sleep while I'm in the middle of something. But normally I would pick, and you can pick any of them, but I would pick Mystify, which is a sort of swirly pattern that you get. Um, and I can turn it on now, so I will turn it off again. So if I preview it, see if this comes through, you get a swirly pattern like that. Um, and I set it to wait for 10 minutes, so that if there's no activity on the machine for 10 minutes, that pattern will take over on the screen. But all you have to do to get back to where you were is click the mouse, click the keyboard, move the mouse, do anything, any activity at all, and it will flip straight back to where you were. Now, the reason I prefer to have a screensaver pattern is that the screensaver pattern reminds you that the machine is still running, because if you sort of walked into other rooms and you come back, you see that there's this swirly pattern occurring, you know the machine is still on. I do not prefer to have it set such that the screen goes blank because when it goes blank, you forget the machine's on. And it, in some people's houses, it could stay on for days without them realizing it. So I don't think going black is really a good idea. It's better to go to a pattern that just reminds you that it's on. So that's why I set screensaver. Now I will take that off for the time being because um, 
I don't want it to do it while I'm doing these uh, course presentations. So that's the screensaver. Set something to set uh, um, Mystify or one of the others to come on after 10 minutes. The other thing I do while I'm here is in change power settings. You notice there's a link here to change power settings. And if you go into here, depending on the machine you've purchased, there could be a, more than one. There could be a balanced and there could be a power save setting. This one's set for balanced, recommended. But what I go to on a new machine is I go to change the plan settings and I select never, because you can select a number of minutes, or never, for both turn off the display and put the computer to sleep. So the same thing for sleep, and you can pick never. Now the reason I pick never for both is A, I don't want it to turn off the display because then you forget the machine's running. That's why we have a screen saver pattern happening. Um, and secondly, I never want it to go to sleep because sleep is actually a dangerous maneuver, um, particularly on a desktop machine. On a desktop machine, it's powered by 240 volts on the mains. There is no battery. So when it goes, if it goes to sleep, uh, as it is set for by default to go to sleep after some number of minutes, probably after 20 or 30 minutes, if it goes to sleep um, and there happens to be a power cut or it happens that you unplug something you probably shouldn't have unplugged uh, or you reset your modem and it's powered off the same board and everything else, if you depower a, a desktop machine that's asleep, there's, a, there's some chance that it won't actually wake up when you plug it back in because it's in a strange sort of environment. Even in sleep mode, it needs some power just to keep um, its position marked as to where it was um, so it can wake up properly. I've had several machines that have not recovered from you know, power being removed when they've been in a sleep mode. So hence, I never allow a desktop PC to go to sleep. On a laptop, it's not as critical because a laptop has a battery pack in it and it will maintain the sleep mode for quite a long time. But again, it could eventually go flat and you'll be in the same problem that uh, you would be if it was a desktop machine. So that's the reason I, I set both of these to never. One is because you'll forget the machine's on, and the other is that if it goes to sleep, it might not wake up. Okay, so having made those changes, you say save changes, and you can close that screen, and you can close this screen once you've applied whatever uh, screen saver you've put on. So you can close that screen. So that to me, those are really important settings and frequently see machines that are set um, still on their defaults because no one has gone in and changed that. So we'll go back to uh, the presentation. Uh, and we've now covered this topic that's down here. The themes area, you, we've set the desktop icons as listed here, but you could set different backgrounds with different colors. That's up to you. Um, that's a totally personal thing. So this is just starting the settings and control panel area. So we'll move on now. And we'll look at the hardware in this machine. Um, the hardware, when I say hardware, that's all the stuff in the box or stuff in the laptop. There's a motherboard, there's a power pack, there's, there's uh, batteries, there's graphics cards maybe, there's USB sockets and all these sort of things. There's a lot of hardware that goes into it. You can get the principles of the hardware by, first of all, and it's a good idea to check this, on a, particularly on a new machine, by going to the Start menu, Setting, System and About on a Windows 10 machine, that will give you an overview of the machine's 
hardware configuration. Um, you can also get it uh, from going to um, the control panel and system. So in each case, it's the system settings, and it will take you to the same, same place as it happens. And in, in this position, it will show you the PC name, it will show you the CPU, central processor unit type model. It will tell you the amount of RAM, random access memory that's been installed. It will tell you the operating system edition and its version. So that's pretty fundamental stuff to know about the machine. Um, we will then go from there to device manager, which will show you um, a lot more detail about the hardware that's in the machine. And I will open that up um, when I've gone to the desktop. So let's go back to the desktop again. So we said we would go to um, settings and um, I'll go to home of the settings and system. So I said go to system. And if you go down, never mind all this other stuff, if you go down to about, you will see here that it shows the name of the machine, um, the processor, the CPU is an Intel Core i5, 4570 CPU running at 3.2 gigahertz. There's 8 gig of memory and it's a 64-bit operating system and it's Windows 10 Home uh, and the version is 22H2 um, and the feature pack and so on. So, But that's basically the, the, the crux of the hardware. It's the CPU, it's the RAM. Unfortunately, here they don't tell you how much disk is installed. Um, we'll come to that later. But it just tells you the CPU, the RAM, and the operating system, basically. Okay. So if we now go to um, back to home, to demonstrate uh, the best way to get to some places in here, because uh, it is if you if you want something like device manager, it's not easy to work out where it is. So one of the ways I said is you just search on device manager rather than trying to go through to it. So when you open device manager, which is now back in the old side of uh, Windows you get uh, a list like this where it's the name of the computer it's still peter f3 and now it lists in more detail all the components the original ones are still there i um, mean the computer and uh, and so on but now there's things like the cd rom drives uh, imaging devices keyboards monitors that are connected um, network adapters and all sorts of things. There's the processor we saw before, i5, 4570, 3.2 and it's got four CPUs. It's a quad processor as they call them. And uh, so you can see each component and you can open up each component. So if I open up disk drives, here we see that the, the disk drives, there's four disk drives in this machine, and they're all listed there. And it's important on a new machine, if you go to this location, that you actually don't see any red crosses or exclamation marks. If any of these devices is not functioning properly or it hasn't got the right uh, software associated with it, there may be a red cross on um, the individual line or there may be an exclamation mark. An exclamation mark is more like a warning whereas a red cross is that there's definitely something wrong. And if you see an exclamation mark or uh, a red cross on any of these items, then particularly in a new machine, it should be investigated straight away. 
because it could be something that needs to be fixed under warranty. But you can go into any of these things and have a look at uh, network adapters. This is where your internet adapter is. And um, if you right click on a particular one, you can go further and drill down into the properties of that device. And you can even look at the driver associated with that device. Now a driver is a little bit of software that's normally generated by whoever makes this device. And the driver is made um, and written by the maker of the device so that this is the interface software to the standard Windows 10 or 11 operating system. Because of course they design the hardware and they've got to give it some um, translation table, if you like, such that the operating system knows how to talk to this device. And that, uh, that translation system is what is called the driver, which sort of makes sense. So the driver can get updated, as it shows here, update driver, you can, you can um, force it to update, or if I say, update driver it's likely to come back and say you've got the best driver already installed but it's better not to actually um, to actually try and update all your drivers the best thing is that if everything's working all right just leave well alone and that goes for anything on a computer if it's working okay don't try and improve it um, so if there's no exclamation marks and there's no red crosses here, everything is happy and that's how you want it to stay. So don't be trying proactively update drivers. And this is what worries me about, um, there is a lot of packages sold by various companies like Driver One that you subscribe to and it promises to keep your drivers up to date. I would never ever install one of those because I don't want someone else messing with those drivers thinking that, oh, I can improve this or I can improve that. Because the problem is when Windows, as in Microsoft, makes changes to the operating system, it knows what drivers are out there. And if some software has changed it to some um, either not standard or a version that's not compatible with your operating system, then when Microsoft does an update, it may break whatever it was updating. Because Microsoft does a lot of these updates, as you saw here, these network adapters, which is made by a company, Realtek, when I went into here, it was actually the driver was from Microsoft. So Microsoft knows that's the driver it would be using for this. So if some other software decides it can do a, do a better job with some other driver, it can cause problems when Microsoft comes along and does an update. So there is no need to update drivers if everything's working okay. The only time you would update drivers is if something's not working okay you would look for a, a later version driver or whatever. So the main point here is just to look at all the components, see if you can identify what they are, and um, see that there's no red crosses or exclamation marks. So we'll go back out of that, and we'll close uh, this and go back to the desktop, and I will go back to uh, the presentation. So we were looking in Device Manager just now, and you can get to Device Manager through Control Panel just the same. It comes up looking just the same. It's just a different path through to it. Um, just to remind you, Device Manager lists all the details of the installed hardware. You can expand the items, right-click components to see their details. Remember, I right-clicked and I looked at properties and we could see uh, the drivers and so on. Don't make changes. If you go in to one of those uh, little screens that like properties screens, just click cancel 
to back yourself out without making any changes. And there should be no yellow exclamation marks or red crosses. If you have a problem, had a hardware problem, this may, be, may provide a clue. So if something wasn't working properly, device manager is a good place to go to see if it shows any clue as to what's happening. Um, and you should try and work out all the hardware components that are listed there. What are they all for? Um, it's just an interesting to get to know your computer better by all the components that are in there. All right, so we'll move on. Um, so the software structure is now something we need to talk about. So software in a Windows uh, 10 or 11 machine is a layered, is a layered system. Um, each layer is built on the previous layer and is totally dependent on that previous layer. So starting at the bottom, the basic layer on a Windows PC is called the BIOS, which stands for Basic Input Output System. And the Basic Input Output System is stored actually in a uh, chip, um, an integrated circuit on the motherboard. And whilst it can be updated, it's sort of in semi-permanent memory. It's uh, held there. Um, such that when the machine is, has no power connected to it, it can retain the software, the programs in it are retained. And when you first turn the machine on, it's the BIOS that starts up. The BIOS software starts up. And for a lot of people, that will be evident by some black and white writing on the screen. So your monitor might be uh, basically blank with some white writing. It may have a trademark that comes up associated with the motherboard, um, which is called a splash screen. But the black and white writing that follows is coming from the BIOS. And the whole purpose of the BIOS is to kick that machine into life. And the BIOS knows where it's going to find the next piece of software. It knows where to go to find the operating system. And the operating system is Windows 10 or Windows 11 in our case. But those are the only two we're talking about. But it could be, um, could be other operating systems and other machines. It could be Linux. It could be Chrome OS. It could be all sorts of things. But in our situation, it's Windows 10 or Windows 11. And then built on top of the operating system is the application software. And this is things like MS Word or MS Excel or um, the browser, you know, Microsoft Edge or in Google's case, Google Chrome. They are applications. They are applications that are connected to the OS, which is connected to the BIOS. So these are the three key layers. And just to remind you, BIOS is stored in a read-only memory on the motherboard. The BIOS uh, non-default settings need a battery. So in a lot of cases, a machine is um, running on what's called the default settings of the BIOS. And uh, it will happily do that. But if you have made setting changes to the BIOS, which can be things like which drive it looks to for an operating system, if you've made non-default settings, then those are stored in the BIOS. But that's why there's a little battery, like a, it's bigger than a hearing aid battery. It's uh, about a, a one centimeter across. It's actually a CR2025 battery that sits in a, in a socket on the motherboard uh, in, the most, in most cases. And that, that stores any non-default settings of the BIOS. Sometimes that BIOS, uh, that uh, battery uh, gets too old and um, you start having problems because when you turn the machine off, a, a desktop machine, when you turn the desktop machine off, it goes back to default BIOS, and then you'll get some funny options coming up in the black and white writing that you may never have seen before. 
but it's a, usually a simple operation to, uh, to take battery out and put a new one in. They're about dollar fifty. I mean, they're not that expensive. And the BIOS is the BIOS software is provided by the motherboard manufacturer. So uh, whoever made the board will have provided the BIOS that goes with it. Um, it might be an Intel board or it might be a gigabyte board. There's only you know, less than half a dozen manufacturers of motherboards. But whoever built the motherboard uh, provides the appropriate BIOS for it. So the BIOS is the black and white writing when you first see and uh, you start up the machine. Sometimes machines are set not to show that black and white writing. So don't worry if you don't see any black and white writing. All they've done is they've suppressed it showing and it goes straight to the Windows um, icon. So it may or may not be evident. The operating system, in our case Windows 10 or Windows 11, is stored on the internal hard drive, what we will know in the future as the C drive. Um, it's stored on that internal hard drive, which could be a spinning drive, um, spinning at 5,400 or 7,200 RPM, or it could be in a solid state drive. That just depends on the configuration of the machine. But that's stored on that. And the reason it's stored there is because it's substantial. It could be 15 gigabytes uh, in size. So it's not going to be stored in a ROM on the motherboard. Uh, it's going to be stored on some um, storage device. And the OS gets its settings, like the, the non-default non BIOS settings. If, if there is settings for the operating system, they are in the registry. Uh, the operating system registry, which we will look at in due course. And that registry is also in st in, uh, stored on the internal hard drive. So the OS loads, and you know it, the operating system is loaded when you get to the Windows desktop, you know, the normal desktop with your icons and the taskbar at the bottom and the start button and so on. When you've got to the Windows desktop, that's when the operating system has finished loading. And then the third layer, the applications, which are things like Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, MS Word, MS Excel, Adobe Photoshop, all those things are also stored on the internal hard drive, the same as the operating system. And the application preferences, like the settings for those applications, are also stored in the registry. So not only the registry stores the operating system settings and preferences, but also it stores the application software um, settings and preferences. Okay, so looking further at the software, um, how do you know what software is loaded on this machine? Um, we've looked at the hardware and the list of hardware components and the, the applications have a similar um, sort of list if you like. Um, you can get to the ones in the settings panel, the list and setting panel by going to start settings or apps or you can go via control panel and select uh, control panel, you can just select it, type control panel and select it. Uh, in control panel, they are listed under programs and features. And um, apps, these apps here, has only the size of the software and installation date um, when you go to it this way. But in control panel, it also lists the publisher, installation date, size and version. So you get more information if you look under control panel. Um, so we'll go to it there. So we'll go to the desktop um, again. We'll go to, remember, start button, type control panel. And you will get the control panel that way. And you look for programs and features. And here is the list of software on this machine. And it's quite an extensive list, as you can see. Um, 
there's a lot of uh, um, software installed on this machine. A, a brand new machine that you've just set up and initialized might only have a dozen items here, even less possibly. So, you know, this is accumulated over time. It's covering printers and all sorts of software functions that I have installed on this machine. But as you can see, um, you've got the name of the software, Adobe Acrobat Reader. You've got the publisher. You've got the date on which it was installed. You've got the size and in most cases, the version of that software. And that's the same for all of it. Yeah. It's an interesting point that I often do to some of this software is really from when the first machine was first loaded with any software. And so if you click on installed um, a couple of times such that the oldest software is listed at the top, you can see this, uh, some of this software was installed in 2014. And that gives you a rough idea of how old this machine is. So this machine is now nine years old. Um, this would not be true if at some stage I had reloaded the machine from scratch, what's called a, a bare metal install, then it would show the date of when that was done. But because this machine has never been reloaded, um, it's showing the oldest software load as 2014, which would be about right. If you click on name again, you get these go back into alphabetical order, which is the best way to have it. Uh, so you can find the software you're looking for. Um, but there is a lot of software. And again, it's a good exercise to go through. I mean, you, you won't necessarily have such a long list, but it is an interesting exercise to go through and try and identify what each component of software is for. If you want to un uninstall a piece of software, you can right click on it and click on uninstall or change. But uninstall uh, is one way of getting rid of the software and it will go through a process of uninstalling that component of software. But unless you know what you're doing, not a good idea. Um, but I'm just letting you know that's what you can do. So let's just go back to the presentation and see where we're at. So this is where we're at here is programs and features, listing the publisher, installation date, size, and version. Uh, try and work out what each item is used for. Remove the software by highlighting and selecting uninstall, just as I showed you. 